I will share today with you some of the results of my current work on the structure of the central Mariana trough and its asymmetric opening. And it's all based on a seismic tomographic study. And before starting, I would like to acknowledge my uh, supervisors at GEOMAR and also my Japanese partners at Yamstek. So uh, even though backup basins represent only a small proportion of the Earth's surface, they highly influence the ocean circulation and also the evolution of Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific, as we already have heard from Jeffrey. And as you can see on the map, um, especially along the Western Pacific, there's the greatest number of backup basins occur and partly open episodic as indicated by the extinct basins. Um, they play an important role in this highly dynamic setting and it's also um, visible inside some of them that they have a lot of different expressions in the seafloor. So back Ike Basin formation involves, as we already have heard, divergent and convergent plate boundaries, which broadens the controlling variables of the basin. As you can see here in this uh, section through um, uh, back Ike Basin, where we have the divergent setting uh, here with the ridge controlling magmatism and also the subducting slab going down with dehydration melting and also arc formation. Um, depending on the dominant stress fields during the spec arc basin formation, um, this can may influence the position and the shape of the trench and also re-affect then the tectonic kinematics, which can in some uh, cases result in asymmetric basin formation or other complex shapes, as you can see here down as an example from the low basin. Um, here, for example, in the lower part, it seems rather symmetrical, but the further we go north, it opens up asymmetrically. And this can can cause some problem, problems, especially regarding plate reconstruction, because these margins do not always fit well together when you try to reconstruct them. And this is a reason why it's very important to have a look at some local basins and also try to understand their um, opening history. Because only if we understand these, we can um, reconstruct the models correctly. Further, back up basins are study areas for crust generation and related processes. And due to the interaction between the two different melt regimes in this uh, area, it's a good place to test our understanding of melting, crust generation, and the effects on the oceanic crust and lithosphere. So they are a valuable contribution um, to our understanding in general. So, and now let's go straight into the topic. Um, my study focuses on the Mariana Trough, which is the youngest back arc basin in a series of back arcs and arcs which developed within the Isabunen Mariana Arc system on the Western uh, Pacific. The system is uh, situated on the Eastern margin of the Philippine Sea Plate, as you can see here in the map and also here. And um, it is shows a complex uh, subduction zone setting here. We have a double subduction zone setting with the Pacific plate subducting westwards um, underneath the Philippine Sea plate. And we have then additionally, the Philippine Sea plate subducting underneath Eurasia on the left-hand side here at the Q, uh, Rio Q um, trench. And also here to Sunderland and the Luzon arc on, um, the Philippine Trench. The Pacific material, which is subducting underneath, is uh, of mid-Jurassic age at the moment, and uh, is at the moment forming in the southern part or opening is um, the Mariana Trough, which we will um, have a look in in a moment. Um, the eastern part of, of the Mariana Trough, together with the arc, forms at the moment a microplate, which is called Mariana Platelet. And it's, as you can see here from the GPS measurements inside the basins, um, the platelet is moving in the same direction as uh, the Philippine Sea plate, but at a very slower rate, uh, of slower rate compared to the other part. Another important feature here is um, the slab angle along the, uh, the um, Isobunin Mariana Trench uh, changes highly and uh, is in the northern part where the Isobunin section is very flat, but then towards the central part of the Mariana Trough, where here approximately my uh, study area is, steepens 
highly and dips down nearly vertically and even shows uh, tendencies of bend, uh, backward bending. Um, the Mariana Trough itself formed in the second phase of backup basin opening that started about 8 million years ago when the arc split into today's remnant West Mariana Ridge, which is now situated here on the west, and the Mariana Arc, um, which is the currently active uh, volcanic front um, on the east. The exact timing and of the transition from rifting to sea spreading is still under debate, but is considered to begin somewhere between three to five million years. And the Mariana Trough shows today an increased spreading rate from north to south. So it's opening faster in the south than in the north. The strong curvature also indicates that we, the opening influenced the trend shape. And uh, there's a lot of discussion at the moment also going on how the Ugazavara Plateau uh, might have interacted in this, in this role. So we have, uh, have a rather complicated setting. But also, um, we have a lot of um, benefits uh, from studying this area because we are in an interoceanic setting. So we had no collision with uh, continents or other arcs. And uh, we have one end member case here with a steep slab, which uh, gives it a great um, yeah, study area. So this, also, this leads us to the question of how can we analyze the basin structure? And since maybe not everyone is familiar with the seismic tomography technique, I will give a very brief description of the basic concept behind it without going into detail. So generally, uh, it uses the same principle as a computer tomography, as in medicine, you may have you know. And instead of X-rays, we use seismic waves, um, as you can see along the profile, um, as, as uh, lines painted that um, travels through the crust and also through anomalies, which could be inside or differences. And uh, instead of the body uh, material densities, we derive from these uh, seismic velocities and associated structures within the basin. And to do this, uh, we, we identify the traveling times. And then uh, we derive from, with the help of a nonlinear inversion based on a starting model, in a stepwise approach than a final velocity structure model. And this gives us an idea about how the um, basin is shaped and what kind of structures we have. Um, to make sure that the result is independent from the initial starting model, this procedure uh, is repeated several times, up to 100 times, by uh, randomly perturbating this and then uh, averaging the model. And um, the method applied has some limitations and, and to avoid misinterpretation, uh, we have to analyze the confidence by some statistical tests as, such as checkerboard tests, standard deviation, or calculation of the rate uh, coverage. Um, here in the um, picture, you can see some of the results. And um, I was just want to highlight one, two things here because um, generally we have a good uh, st statistical values which show that our model is quite reliable, but we have two zones um, with higher uncertainties which are situated here in the central part of the basin. Here um, we have lower ray coverage and also um, a higher standard deviation as well as a low resolution inside our checkerboard models. While we have to be very careful in interpreting these areas, and um, that our model may not show like true real structures. So um, this is a result from our seismic uh, tomography study. And as you can see already, just from looking on it, the most prominent features are like these high velocity zones, which we have at the margins of the basin to the east and to the west, with velocities uh, up to 7.5 to 7.9 kilometers per second, which is unusually high and uh, would Grace associations to uh, to morphic, uh, ultramorphic um, compositions. Compared to these, uh, we have in the central part of the basin a lower velocity structure, which shows uh, increases from three point five to six point five kilometer, uh, uh, sorry, thick um, crust which where the velocities just reach the maximum values of 7.2 to 7.4 kilometers. And this results in a velocity gradient, which is typical also for oceanic type crust. Um, 
over above it uh, in the entire basin, we have an upper velocity, which is typical um, for oceanic type layer two crust. And um, therefore we think that the central part shows more like this typical mob spreading type development compared to the uh, margins. The zone A here uh, in the picture marked is a high uncertainty zone, which I mentioned beforehand. And underneath uh, the spreading axis, the modern position is here marked on top. And in the gray um, areas, we see um, a lower velocity zone as well. And uh, we also see an increase in uh, crustal thickness. So this um, entire area, as you can see here also from the plot below, shows um, that we have unusual high crustal thicknesses. As a reference, I plotted here the dashed blue line for typical oceanic crust. And as you can see, all values are way above it. But um, the range uh, of these unusual velocities is also still within the framework, which have been previously observed in slow spreading um, systems. Also, the velocities um, for the lower crust are generally higher than that of oceanic crust. And this are already indicates us that we have a mental heterogeneity over time, since um, we can just explain the development of these high velocity zones with a change in the uh, melt supply or in the composition, and that we have a need to have additional melt supply um, to, to, cr uh, to create these thick um, crust. Um, now, 10, no, that's, that's 11 minutes or 12 minutes now, actually. So, you know, yeah. And um, coming now to the high velocity zones, as mentioned beforehand, um, these high velocities indicate that, um, that there must be a difference in the melting process, which most likely uh, have been done by incorporation of another mineral phase, such as olivine or pyroxine. And um, this can just be realized uh, by, by adding different type of melts. And due to their location at the margins of the basin, they must have been, during an early phase of opening, been uh, closer to the current trench and therefore closer to the subducting slab. And um, this could lead uh, to the supply of hydrous flux or melt flux melting into the backup basin setting. And uh, these can then do, do an enrichment uh, of um, peroxines due to uh, plagioclast suppression by crystallization and enhancing uh, pyroxine and uh, olivine. Um, this is supported by rock samples, which we have uh, inside the basin, which show a decreasing subduction derived signature towards the spreading axis. And uh, another interesting feature is that we can also find these um, high velocity zones in other backup basins, such large as the Paracevela basin or the Shikiko basin as well as um, long and as lower crusted bo uh, bodies inside the Norwegian margin, even though they little uh, have uh, different shapes and also slightly different velocities. So this um, so indicates that this must be a rifting related process where water must play an important role. Um, I really want to mention just this shortly. Additionally, um, to check how the um, basin developed, we had to make sure that we don't have a ridge jump inside the system. And a an really easy way to do it is uh, to calculate the theoretical subsidence curves by cooling and check if there's an interruption, at least for the seafloor spreading uh, phase. As you can see here, the curve trend fits nicely with the tendency of the um, seafloor to the western side of the basin. Unfortunately, the eastern side is too short. But based on this, we can also calculate some uh, spreading time estimations for the basin and came to the conclusion that uh, uh, the best fitting part um, or curve would be an age of 5 million years. So um, another important thing we, we, uh, we observed was a change in the strike uh, angle change of the um, abyssal, abyssal seafloor hill fabric, um, which changed it a uh, north west southeast trend to a more north southern direction in the central part and um, this change occurred approximately at the same position as we could see um, the change from the rifting phase into the seafloor spreading phase so um, there must be something happening during the opening time 
And this leads us now to my uh, our last conclusion that um, the timing and the um, change in seafloor spreading um, must have uh, been caused by some large scale tectonic change at 5 million years because the Mariana Trench behaved nearly stationary. And the only reason how um, the change in curvature and uh, in the opening could, could have been done must uh, be in a far field. And at about 5 million years, the subduction, region, uh, subduction direction change uh, of the Pacific plate, which triggers on a couple of rearrangements inside the southeastern and western Pacific region, causing the Philippine um, sea plate pole to move and that causes then um, a change in the subduction direction of the Luzon arc, as well uh, initiated the subduction of the Philippine Trench and Rikyo Trench. So um, as we mentioned previously, um, the GPS vectors show that the Philippine sea plate is moving way faster. And so we can say that this faster subduction westward most likely pulls the western part further and faster away and causes the most crust accumulation on the west and because the eastern past was nearly stuck, um, magma can inject several times and overprint the crust to the east and sicken it. Um, here you can see a short summary again of, the, uh, of our main conclusions. And um, I'd like to say thanks for your attention. I hope maybe there are some questions. Thanks very much. Yeah, so I'll open up for any questions if you just put your hand up or put something in the chat. Otherwise, I have a question if nothing appears. So I don't see any questions appearing. Um, so I've got a question about this asymmetry. Uh, you know, you did show this asymmetry in crustal thickness uh, and seismic velocity structure about the ridge axis. I mean, how well constrained is the timing of this, like from magnetic stripes? Or how, 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 you didn't comment much about the, the data. Yeah. That's a very big problem, especially inside the Mariana Trough region, because the plate and especially the Mariana Trough opened close to the magnetic equator. So we have some uh, magnetic signals and anomalies inside the region, but they are very weak and it's very hard to um, to correlate them and also to analyze them. So often there is a lot of uh, interpretation and modeling involved. And um, so the so also these results are sometimes uh, controversial and sometimes not clear, which makes it very hard. I wouldn't say that my solution is the best maybe because I also had a discussion with some other colleagues regarding like small ridge jumps, which have just maybe a few kilometers, which may overprint and the signal of interrupting or extinct uh, ridge valley. So I think that's the main question, which is still ongoing inside the Mariana Trough, like if they are real ridge jumps or if it's station. 